Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. G'day, welcome to Kingdom Stories from Down Under. My name is Nathaniel Costilla and it's a joy to have you here with us. This initiative is to profile and to hear wonderful stories from Down Under. Down Under, we call it Down Under because, you know, as the globe is round, Australia is Down Under and that's why it is called that way. Uh, these stories are of people from here from Australia, kingdom-minded people. We believe the kingdom of God is advanced one person at a time and those people who made Jesus Christ their saviour and king are walking with him every single day. And these people have wonderful stories and testimonies and experiences with the Lord and it's wonderful to be able to hear these stories, to be encouraged, to be built up and to make sure that we do the same as these people do. My first guest uh, at Kingdom Stories from Down Under is Trevor Stiles. Trevor Stiles is a Western Australian. He was born in Bustleton, not far away from Perth, about two and a half hours south of Perth, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And uh, it is a privilege to have him with us. He um, went to the uh, Royal Australian Navy for nine years, and then for the next 40 odd years he worked in finance and admin. He's currently retired, but not really retired as such. Retired from the workforce, but not from the Kingdom of God. He's uh, the chairman of Governor's Prayer Breakfast, a wonderful initiative here in Perth that he leads. And every year there's a massive event uh, where thousands of people come together to pray for our city and for our governor. The governor always attends, of course. We, uh, he's also part of the Prepare the Way ministry of Peter Pollock, and he leads that here in Australia. He is a member of Kingsway Christian Church, an active member, if I may say. He um, also is part of a Friday Men's Fellowship that gathers right in this facility. And he's part of the Wanderer and Jundalab Geo Network here in Western Australia. Welcome, Trevor. Thank you, Nathaniel. What a wonderful bio you have. This is just so, so uh, wonderful. And look, to break the ice for you to stand up and just come out here and do this interview, it's just wonderful. Thank you. Tell me, uh, where did it all begin for you? So you were born in, in Baselton, yes. not far away from mm -hmm. here, mm. a true blue Australian. Absolutely. And uh, what was it like living in Baselton? Well, Baselton is, um, I, I know Baselton well from, in my later years, but as a young child, I didn't know much about it because um, we left Baselton when I was five years of age, after my mother and father had separated, and I was raised by my grandmother and auntie and I had a brother and a sister that we lived in Bunbury for until I was 15 years of age. So at the age of five, mm -hmm. your mother and dad split? That's right, yes. Do you remember anything from that period? No, very little about it, only stories that you hear from other people. Um, it was, uh, you know, he, it was, my father unfortunately was in, the, in, in North Africa during the war and it was not a very nice place in World War II and he obviously suffered the traumas of war. From Australia to North Africa? Yes. Right. Yeah, and also he served in New Guinea. And uh, in, in my later years I've realised that uh, he would have had post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, he was um, uh, drinking and stuff like that. But he, he, he married three times. So I've got um, two, uh, full brother and a sister, and I've got um, another half-sister and another half-brother. So you moved to Bunbury and you live with your mum and your grandma? And my auntie. And your auntie? Yeah, for several years. My auntie got married and left after a while, but my grandmother and mother okay. raised me. But I did leave Bunbury at 15 years of age to join the Navy. Okay. Um, I went there to join the Royal Australian Navy Band. Yes. Uh, playing French, French horn. French horn. French horn and left some drums. Yeah. And, um, but sadly, when I went to do my grade six examination, I didn't quite make it. So I was quickly transferred to the stores for the Navy and they sent off to sea when I was about 17 years of age. Wow. And uh, I spent time in, up in the Malacca Straits, just there was a conflict between Indonesia and Malaysia and we were patrolling the Straits there just to make sure. You spent um, nine years in the... Nine years in the service, Navy. yes. Yeah, nine years in the Royal Australian Navy. Um, my main job was looking after the menus and the food, so everybody liked me, <laughs> unless I gave them the wrong sort of food, of course. But um, 
Now, I did serve in Vietnam. That was um, something that uh, was um, very much different, actually. During peacetime, it's not so bad being in the military, but when sure. you go to war, then there are some fears that creep in. Although we're well trained and we've been um, all, all uh, well trained and set up to handle various um, mishaps. Did you get off the ship? Oh, often. We often got off the ship, but not in the war zone. Yes. We would go off to either the Philippines or Hong Kong or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were the only ship, Royal Australian Navy ship, and we, we served with the US 7th Fleet during that time. And we're the only Navy ship, the Royal Australian Navy ship, that lost any men during that war. Oh. And that was the one I was on. It happened one, one night, early in the morning, really, about 2 a.m. I just got myself into bed, and uh, the next minute all the alarms are sounding, and we're rushing around getting to action stations and working out what's going on, and we've been hit by two missiles. Fortunately, they were air-to-air, not air-to-service. We probably would have got sunk if it was air-to-service missiles, but... Um, they hit our ship and uh, killed a couple of guys, injured a number we had to send home for, for re rehabilitation. Uh, but sadly, it was friendly fire, US Air Force. And, oh. um, anyway, that was a, an interesting night, which caused us to go back to the Philippines mm. to be repaired. Took about six weeks. Uh, during that time, I had some R&R &R in the Manila, and I stayed with the Australian ambassador, which is very interesting. And That's nice. So that was uh, that. And then we went back out again and spent some more time out there, but we had greater defence and uh, sort of um, radar equipment that helped us to pick things up. And did you get married during this time or afterwards? I, um, after the Vietnam service, which probably lasted over about three years because I was on a couple of ships, the first part of it we were taking troops to and from Vietnam, Yeah. but then they finally put me on a real ship and a destroyer and we had to go and be part of the fighting unit. Um, <clears throat> but after that I was posted to Fremantle at the uh, depot was called HMAS Doon. I was yep. there about three months. During that time, I met Cheryl, my wife, um, mm -hmm. at the Pagoda Ballroom at a dance for British sailors. I happened to be one of the few Aussies there. Um, I what was her. she doing there? She was there trying to find a British sailor who would probably get taken to the UK or something. Ah. <laughs> but anyway, she, she ended up with me. And the interesting thing is that I found out later, she never wanted to marry a guy called Trevor. She never wanted to marry a guy who was in the military, especially if he'd been to Vietnam. So um, she got the lot, you know. But that was 50 years ago, in 1970, we were married. And I served out uh, two years uh, when we were married in the service. And then we came back to Western Australia and settled down here. What, um, what are some of the challenges you were facing as a young lad in the, in the, Air Force, in the Navy? In the Navy? Um, the challenges were, well, I mean, it was a life very different to civilian life. Uh, you know, there's a lot of drinking. I mean, maybe the best way to put it, what you ever heard about sailors, I did, except I didn't have tattoos. Okay. Um, so there were challenging moments. That's why you can wear shorts. And yeah, that's right. And just um, these. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it was challenging at different times, but obviously that night in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, off Vietnam, North Vietnam was um, quite a challenging night for all of us. Um, I really turned my hand to getting comfort foods and stuff to the guys and uh, we had to assess. We didn't know who had done what and uh, it was a bit of a mess. But What's the biggest sort of lesson for you from the... Military. Yeah. The biggest lesson from military, I think, if we sort of um, discipline. Uh, you have to be disciplined. Um, if you don't self-discipline, you get disciplined, you know. And I really think that really helps you when you finally find yourself in the kingdom of God. It is about discipline and his discipline and our self-discipline and commitment. Um, yeah, you still shave every morning? I still shave every morning. I never grew a beard or a moustache. And you still do your bed with your wife in it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I make my bed every day with a few exceptions. Um, there was an admiral who said, if you make your bed every day, at least you've got a good start, you can get home at night and say, at least I made my bed. Yeah. Yeah. So that was sort of interesting, but um, no, I'm, I don't make my bed with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I was just joking. Yeah. joking. So you're quite regimented still. Some of, some of the good habits are still there. Yeah, I think some people see me, if I have an office, I'll be a minimalist, nothing on my desk. Yeah. No paperwork, nothing like that. Especially in this day and age, it's all on the computer, so I don't have to have yeah. Back there in the Navy days, we had lots of paperwork, you know, but uh, that's right. So quite like neat, organised, obviously, yeah, yeah, a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah, one lady told me that's what it was like. You know. <laughs> God showed it, obviously, because yeah. she didn't know me. So where, the, where did the Christian walk begin for you? Well, the Christian walk was interesting. Um, you Were know, you parents, I, uh, your mum, dad, anyone? Grandma? My mother was, the whole family attended church, um, okay. an Anglican church just around the corner from our home in Bunbury. 
um, my mother and sister and brother in the choir, and my grandmother as well, and also and I was involved in altar boy at the Anglican Church in Bunbury. Um, and I sort of was, you know, I, I enjoyed that. And I also loved to sit around and listen to older people talking about the scriptures and about the Lord. Uh, but that all sort of diminished and dissolved away once I joined the military. Um, the attractive, attractiveness, attraction to the world got a hold of me. And uh, that, was, that was it for many, many years. Probably the best part of 20 years wow. before I, I got uh, apprehended by God again. How did it happen? Well, how it happened was, um, first of all, uh, I just shared, sh we couldn't have any children um, in 1976 through to 79 and uh, the, the scientists have had a go at it, you know, with different methods and things, but um, Cheryl called out to the Lord on Christmas Day in 79 and uh, the baby was born in 20, exactly nine couple months today, the 25th of September. Cheryl's story, I'm not going to enter, to enter into it because um, I'll probably mess it up. Yeah. But um, from there, um, she started going to church and I just said, no, don't give me that sort of stuff, I'm not interested in that stuff. I had a sort of sense that you know, science wasn't necessary. So to, to her, it was clear that it was God's intervention? Yes, okay. yes, absolutely. And, and, and you know, in, in hindsight, yes, it, it clearly was. I mean, there was many things wrong. Yeah. And, uh, they were all sorted out. Anyway, so what happened with me yeah. is, um, is back to you. that um, in 19, about 1981, 82, that was um, just a year or so after my daughter was born, and another daughter came along during that period as well. But um, I started to um, just, I, don't know, I was in a bar in Carina. It was called Mary's Bar. I was playing darts after cricket training and drinking beer. And I walked up to the bar and grabbed a couple of beers for the boys. And I was just about picked them up with this voice. Spoke from the inside of me, very clear. Nobody else would have heard it. And it simply said, Trevor, there's more to life than this, you know. That was all it said, all it said. And I just continued. Nothing changed much, except I did get a bit interested in spiritual things. And I became um, sort of polytheistic, that uh, every side of the mountain takes you up to the top. Yeah. Uh, whereas um, there's only one road that leads to, to God. But what happened there is um, many people spoke to me about their ideas and religion and so forth. But one day, about a year or so after, I was returning to my office in Jolly Mont, and as I stepped on the steps after lunch, um, the same boy spoke again and said, you know, Trevor, you're wrong. Jesus is the only way. Now, did that change me? Not really. I heard that voice and um, things changed. And then uh, I, I read in, in, you know, in recent days, not back then, that Oswald Chambers said, the crisis will come. Yeah. And sure enough, the crisis came in about 1980, August 1985. And uh, the crisis was some uh, wrong uh, accounting and different things in the office. And I was dragged in by the security officer at the company to see the CFO. And the CFO spoke to me, and it was quite an emotional time. And um, you know, I had a long talk to my wife about those things, and we decided that I would go and see the general manager and um, tell him exactly what was happening. Yeah, so there was three or four of us involved. Yeah. Uh, the credit manager, who was my boss, was uh, uh, instantly suspended, and I was um, on leave, so they told me to wait a week and they let me know what they'd do with me. So I came back in a week, um, having been quite sort of <laughs> a bit emotional and wondering what was going to happen, intense and all that. And I saw the general manager and he said, you can stay. I'm not going to dismiss you. I've dismissed the credit manager, but you can stay. And uh, I stayed for, um, and, but he, I was demoted from a supervisor to a senior clerk for a period of time. And then um, uh, it, uh, it, uh, the other guy that was, was dismissed and they brought in another credit manager from somewhere else. And it was a whole story again. He wasn't the best guy. But um, <clears throat> anyway, we... Um, continued for six or seven months as a clerk, another lady as a supervisor. It was a, a group of about 15 or 16 of us working in the, in, in the division. And um, anyway, after she left, um, this lady took on another position and I was, I was able to take over the supervision of the whole team, uh, 15 people, and that lasted a few months until the um, credit manager said that I wanted to have a job as a credit manager. And I said, well, yes, that would be fine. So. Um, I ended up going to Swan Cement and worked there as credit manager for many, many years. Wonderful. Uh, but discovered that he was actually the other guy who had his finger in the till, and he obviously wanted to get me out of the way because I'd been very clear that if I see anything wrong, it'll right. be reported. You know, as simple as that. And uh, so obviously I'd say he got rid of me. I remember the day, or the Sunday after that occurred, I went to church at one of the 
insolvency practitioner that's came up to me and says, hey, what, what, what's the problem? Why did you want to get rid of you? So yeah. he obviously had some knowledge that I didn't know, whatever. But, um, so that crisis came in 1985, August. And your wife was going to church on a yes, regular basis at this stage? Yes, yes, she was. And I discovered during that time that there were three ladies praying for me. And uh, I think maybe Cheryl was one of them, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, I sat down and I said to God, I said, God, I'll give you two years to prove yourself. So I went off to church. Um, I didn't want to go, I didn't like it very much, but I kept going. I made a deal, you know, which maybe you shouldn't do, but I did it anyway. So this is a two year deal? You yeah, two year to deal. You showed me every Sunday. You proved yourself, and I, yeah, Sunday and many other, you know, more, lots of things I went to. So you gave up quite a bit? Yes, a fair bit, yeah. But, um, Which church was this? It was the Church of Christ over in Warwick. Um, okay. Anyway, once after about, well, it's about 20 months um, mm -hmm. in May 1987, sorry, it's August 1983, get that right, so May 1985, um, I'd been going and learning, and um, this Sunday night I was standing right in the front, the preacher right before me almost, you know, you could sort of see his, the colour of his eyes, and um, he shared a message uh, about the Bethesda pool, which I didn't take a lot of notice of. I, I know it now, but I didn't know it then. And he just said two things after he challenged people to maybe make a decision for Jesus. He simply said, why wait? And when that happened, I just broke down and cried like a baby. And um, the next week was the same every day pretty well until the next Sunday I got baptized. Wow, that happened fast. That happened like that, yes. Was it real? Absolutely. Oh, How absolutely. do you know it was real? Just tears, and, and the fact that, um, you know, it says here in the Bible, uh, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw, draw him. Yeah. And, you know, I know people have um, shared that somebody spoke to them. This was direct from, from God. God, you know, yeah. and uh, it just, uh, all everything happened directly to me. Um, I didn't have any people coming and, and sort of uh, sharing the gospel so much. I mean, I heard people talk about sure. it, but I didn't have that direct intervention by a human being, it was just the Holy Spirit came directly to me and, and obviously from uh, the prayers of the saints. So what were you lamenting? What were you praying? Uh, what were you, why were you crying? Weeping? I don't know. It just happened. It was just from the heart. From It was the Holy Spirit. Were you sorry? Was it repentance? Was it... No. I don't know. It was just weeping. And I think during the week people prayed for me and I started to understand about repentance and, and the lies. But all that stuff was learned afterwards. Okay. It was just like um, now let's so something. Start. Something clicked for you. Something, the penny dropped. My yeah. mind wasn't involved. Okay. Not at all. I don't even remember. I didn't say yes, Lord, or anything. I only just yeah. started crying. Okay. And just cried from the right inside of me, deep, deep down. There was nothing special. So you allowed it to happen, though. Well, yeah. I often, yeah. Obviously, over the last forty years, I think, Lord, what, what's that all about? What, what happened there? And I'm thinking, you know, because I have a will, and you won't violate that. I, I understand that. But um, just the fact that you're curious is enough for him to come and say, yes, uh, okay. let me lead you to Jesus. Let so you knew that this was it? I knew it was it. I, I, everything just happened rapid fire. I got okay. baptized. I couldn't wait. Uh, and, and then so where were you baptized? The in the church? Same place, yeah. In they had 1985. They had a pool inside? They had yes, they had it inside. Yeah. Got this one. All the, yeah, it was all there. Yes, yeah, so I remember one lady, um, after I'd been baptized, she got to know me. And she said, I want to get in the bath as well. So, right. you know, as they say, in your early days, you are a bit of a witness. Yeah. Because um, people notice the change. The were, you, were you on fire to share the... the, the no, I've been, I've been, I'm a sort of pragmatic, sceptical sort of a guy. Yes. And, um, you know, many years ago, a couple of guys came and they were just sort of guys with words of knowledge or whatever you want to call it. Some people call it prophecy. Um, and they just said to me, you're a sceptic. Yeah. And then they explained to me, it wasn't a bad sceptic. You're just very careful. Yeah. And what you read and what you see and you don't accept it all readily and so and that's that's continued all my life I and your wife it. how did she take it I, I guess she was over the moon she it was a bit of a shock i don't know whether it was a shock but um she was probably smiling and happy and uh, but she was very careful with me i must admit she didn't uh, she never, she stopped um sort of bubble bashing me if you put it. i don't think she ever really did it but somebody said just get out of the light you know, yeah the Lord. Sort of thing. Sort of was there a massive change in your behavior 
that was slow and progressive. Um, smoking was the hardest thing to give away. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and a lot of things I continued working. I was a cricket, cricket umpire and different things that I did for many years. Um, so not a lot changed, not in the sense of what I was doing. Um, going to church, yes. Uh, learning the Word of God, yes. Family life. Uh, family life. life. Yeah, it changed. Um, yeah, it changed. The girls were taken to Sunday school, which Cheryl already organised, but it was good that we were all going. But you know, things happen. Many things have happened since then. There's just you know, I get accused of having too many stories, but, uh, and they go on too long about it. To me. But, uh, yeah. What was the next big encounter? For you? The next big thing was the um, Luke three sixteen. It says, "I baptised with water, but He comes after me, baptises with the Spirit of fire." And it became a very, uh, I became very curious about that. I spent a lot of time talking to people about it, reading, praying. And, um, so this was already the 80s, late 80s? Yeah, that was probably about 86. It, it, it happened fairly quickly. You know. Okay. And I was just asking people and I got all sorts of answers. Some were good, some weren't so good. And I read books and some of them I threw into bed and some of them were okay. And until I saw an 80-year-old lady one, one day, she said to me, yeah, I said, you know, all this stuff, people are saying this is not right, it's all stopped, or the devil, or this or that. I said, tell me, Major, what? She said, why don't you ask God? I thought, oh, that's probably a good idea. So uh, one weekend we went down to the sister's place in Bunbury, and uh, there was a young lady there from a Pentecostal church. You know, and she was walking around the table and doing things, and I couldn't understand why she was spending ne getting near me. I mean, this old guy. You know. Anyway, eventually she came out and said, your daughters were sick, and I just prayed for her. And uh, so I asked the two girls, are you sick? And they said, yeah, but we're okay. We're the baby patients, something along those lines. So the next, uh, well, we had a party there and there was people drinking one side and there was a whole group of people standing around a, a weather sort of kettle thing. And what I noticed that they were all believers and some of them did missionaries in different parts of the world. And that got me thinking. So I said to Cheryl, I want to jump into that. I said, we'll go to this church tomorrow. He doesn't even mind me. So off I went to this Pentecostal church, and yeah. something happened to me. Um, you know, hard to explain. I, I was, there was a joy, and there was I was singing in a language that I hadn't understood or didn't know. But that first time in a Pentecostal church. Yeah. And then I was driving home, and we had a wonderful time singing. We left the girls with their auntie, and I came home. And I, um, the next morning, I um, woke up and I slipped into my youngest daughter, laid on the bed, and said, "Lord, well, this is for real. How did you?" Was I like to like the champagne cork comes out of the bottle, all the junk is released, and uh, I know Cheryl said she woke up and said, "Lord, why is it so loud? You wake up the neighbours, and it's like five, six o'clock in the morning, you know." And that's what happened. That's that was being filled with the spirit of some little so I don't know what it is. I've never found a proper name for it. Had she experienced it? She, oh yes, absolutely. before you. Yes. Yes. So she knew it was the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They came and told me things like that before that. I don't know, give me that. I'm skeptical. <coughs> sure about it. So that, that happened, and that, start, that brought on a lot of change. You know. So the next step was to um, just pray about it, and uh, it was time to move on to another fellowship. Uh, like uh, It was a Thursday morning, I was praying, and I really sensed the Spirit of God said, you need to get out of that, you move to this church, the Pentecostal church. And um, so, um, and then Cheryl told me a little while later, she said, that Sunday that I left the church, I was in, she said, God said to me, you won't be coming back here again. Uh, prior to the Thursday, and uh, she said, my husband won't live here. And Thursday I said, well, it's a wow. family hospital church, it's self we One of the things that, that I've learned is that um, if God's asked you to do something, you can write it down like a story. You know, don't move too quick, you know. But uh, so I moved to this Pentecostal church and found myself on the leadership board within six months. Um, and that was a real, that was a baptism of fire. I've never seen how bad leaders can be. <laughs> but you know, that was all part of just learning. And um, anyway, um, we had a time there where the pastor left and we had 12 months, no pastor. A little senior pastor that was. And we prayed for 12 months every Saturday until um, uh, a guy called Bruce Munn and his wife came. You know, what happened there, let me just quick little story. I was in church one Sunday towards the end of this 12 months. And I had this sort of, um, <clears throat> the word fire in my mind. And I thought, well, the fire, Holy Spirit, you know, that sort of thing. But the Lord showed me to start fire of destruction here. And wow. uh, I thought, wow, anyway. Uh, by, and then the following Tuesday, I went and saw another board member, uh, Welshman. 
And he's a very neat sort of guy. And he said, I've never drawn in my Bible, Trevor. And he said, but I have drawn something in my Bible on Sunday night. And I said, oh, he said, I drew a fire uh, next to um, the Tony shoes and James. And, you know. yeah. So I said to him, I said, you know, we need to sort this senior pastor thing out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And so we, we've done just like that. Snap, done. Point of three months. No, forgot about all the constitutional stuff. We knew we couldn't get anywhere. The place was so fragmented. And uh, we appointed this guy and his wife to take three months as a caretaker type of arrangement. Three months later, they were voted in as so 97% of people were happy with it. So that, spent, that started the um, uh, about 11 year or 12 year relationship with that guy. I was sort of like uh, very close. And we started the television ministry called Priority One. He was the guy, the producer, I was just the admin guy. Sort of, yeah. So you've done a <laughs> bit of TV work and production? Not and really, no, he just mainly admin. Yeah. But I've been through yeah, a lot of experience in being on a board and trying to, you know. You've been on quite a few boards, haven't you? Uh, it's two or three. Um, but I remember one night uh, at a board meeting, we had this opportunity to um, send the television ministry through South America and that somebody was going to do all the dubbing in Spanish or whatever yeah. in, uh, in America and it was going to be paid for. And we just had to, a little bit of money to contribute. And, and two or three of the guys on the board were millionaires. And I'm sitting there as a board member thinking, that, that they want a business plan to do this. And I'm thinking, just give it the money, you know? Yeah. I got a bit angry, you see. I, I hope it didn't show. But I was driving, I said, Lord, I'll do it. Yeah. I haven't got much, but I'll give it to him. I'll give him yeah. you know, this amount of money. And he said, no, you won't. I said, why? He says, no, you need to do it. Don't give it. Wow. So I went home and a month or two passed and uh, I was getting ready for church one Sunday and sure I was in the shower and she stepped out and she said, I just spoke, we need to give that money to the ministry now. She said, sit down. I said, why? She said, it's a lot of money. I said, okay, sit down. She said, the figure, I said, that's exactly what I want. Yeah. So immediately we gave the check. And they said, there's lots of little things like that. Yeah. So after all that, moving to Pentecostal Church, um, I... Uh, and we were involved in the television ministry. It was an interesting time. Um, you know, there was one Sunday, I remember a young chap walked in. And normally I would sit in the front being sort of the altar prayer or something. Or so. And uh, this guy walks in and I sat at the back of the church this day in my three-piece suit. Those days you used to wear a three-piece suit. And this guy comes in and all I would turn around and sit to him, it's really nice. That's what I said. I don't know why I said that. Yeah. Anyway, a few years later, um, he, he actually brought his whole family and a lot of other people the next week to church. Yeah. And a little while later when I got to know him a bit, he said, you know, the, I walked in with the question, is this real? Wow. And uh, that's the word of knowledge or whatever you want to call it. I just said, it's real, you know. That's exactly what you told him. The answer. You actually gave him the answer. I didn't know the question. I just no. gave him the answer, you know. So that was interesting. And there's lots of little things like that throughout my um, Walk with Jesus. Tell me a little bit about Governor's Prayer Breakfast. How did it start and how has right. it grown? Because yeah. at the moment, you know, we're talking 1,000 plus people um, joining that, in. That was again. interesting. Maybe I can just um, backpedal a little bit to yeah. the middle of the 90s. Okay. About 94, 95, there was a guy who came to spend a week at our church and I was driving around and so forth. And, uh, and he gave me a word, it was about three minutes and it was all taped. Yes. And. Um, the essence of the word was that I'll join you to a man of God. Mm-hmm. And you'll enjoy it, you'll be like Jonathan was, and like Jonathan's armor bearer was, you take risks for him and so forth. And you, you'll sweep up any sort of yeah. messes that anybody into that particular person might make. Anyway, um, I, uh, I, I took it and I typed it up and I went and prayed with my pastor and just, yeah. I didn't put it on the shelf, so to speak, I just left it in my heart and thought, Lord, I'm not doing anything, it's entirely. If yeah. this is to happen, it'll be you. So, um, <clears throat> then in um, the TV ministry was um, getting going well. It was around Australia, it was in India, New Zealand, and South America, and so forth. And uh, so I got a call one morning. I was just sitting in my room praying, and this call from America. I, can't remember, I think I made the call. I was talking to this evangelist, to, and he said, "You need to come to America for the National Religious Broadcasters Conference." Okay. So uh, Cheryl gets up in a bit and said. Oh, I've been asked to go to America, and she says, God's will, his bill. <laughs> God's will, his bill. His bill, that's it. Okay, he's got to pay for this. Yes. Yeah, okay. the bottom line was that I asked a friend to come with me, and he said, no, I'll pay for it. But I, yeah. if God's sending you, he paid for it. It all, it all got sorted out. 
So I arrived in Dallas um, uh, for 10 days. Yes. And uh, I was an absolute mess. I was jet lagged, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't do anything. And I got a bit desperate one night and I said, God, what, for, what did you bring me here for? Even the room start, you know, yes. in, in, in a hotel there in, um, near Fort Worth. <laughs> and then I had a vision. Vision one was um, resign from all your church activity. That was vision one. Mm. So I said, okay, I'll do that. I said, if I have to do that, I've got to leave that place. Been leader for 12 months, for 12 years. Um, ten, tempted to leave from a suspicion of submission. People will still think I'm a leader. Yeah. Next vision was, you don't leave there, you stay there. Oh. So I stayed and, uh, for, and I think we stayed there for the best part of five years. And during that time, there was many relationships just needed to do things to be. Yes. And so that all got sorted out. Um, but that was 2001 that I went to Dallas in February. Uh, then in 2002, about the middle of 2002, I had a phone call one Sunday afternoon if I'd like to go and have a look at the Governor's Prayer Breakfast and see what the committee does at the Kevin Minson's house. So they, they had been running this for how long? Uh, then it's probably been running for oh, probably the best part of a decade, I suppose. <coughs> Maybe a bit less. Anyway, I went there and um, I ended up with an assignment. Yes. And the assignment was to organise a guest speaker whom they told me who it was. So I proceeded to do that, not knowing really what I was doing. Now this is Dr. Kevin Minson, the dentist, yes. the lecturer. Yes. He's, uh, he's my neighbour, you know. Yeah, I know. So anyway, I um, proceeded to try and organise this guy to come and speak. By February, I think it was in 2003, I got the message he couldn't come. Yes. Now my wife and the television producer guy said to me, I don't think that's the right guy. Okay. So that's well, I'm, I'm on an assignment. I've been told what to do. I'm just going yes. to do. Anyway, then I thought, well, I can't come. What do I do? You know, it's only a few months away. So I um, I spoke to uh, went down to the TV office. Spoke to the producer there, uh, Bruce. He said, just pray for a couple of days. So then I said to Sh Cheryl, I said, yeah, just she said, yeah, well, we'll just wait and see. So it was a Thursday. Yeah. Day. And so I prayed Friday, we prayed Saturday, and Sunday morning I wake up and I have this name in my mind. And I remembered somebody said to me many years ago, just, just wait on that uh, thought when you first wake up, and maybe God's saying something. So I waited a bit and then it became bigger. So I said to my show, Sir Cheryl at breakfast, I said, you know, I think Peter Pollock's the uh, speaker. He said, that's the guy. How did you know the name? Pretty. Okay. Yeah, he's, a, he's an international cricketer. I used to love cricket. I watch cricket. I play cricket. Did you hear his testimony? Did no, you read a book? I, knew, you he I knew that he was a Christian because he, I hadn't seen it, but I knew that he'd been interviewed by a television okay. the year before. Okay. Uh, but not much. I didn't know much about it. And then um, in... Uh, so I went down to see uh, the TV office and saw Bruce and uh, they told him, he says, yeah, he says, that's the man, you know. Because he'd interviewed him, he knew. And I said to, Bruce said to me, well, I said to Bruce, sorry, I said, well, I don't know how to contact this guy. I don't know, because in South Africa, that's about it. Yes. He said, I have a mutual friend. So he rang his mutual friend in Frio and the mutual friend rang Peter in Durban and we started the arrangements underway. But little did I know that on the Friday, after the Thursday, before yes. I got that name, he'd rung Perth to okay. his friend down in Freo and said, I booked three weeks to come to Perth and you, have, you haven't done anything about it, so I'm cancelling it. Then Monday he receives... Had he been here before? Yeah, yeah many yeah. times. He okay. cricket, but as a preacher as well. Yeah. And that's an, he's got a whole story there about how that happened. And then anyway, um, uh, the next thing was... Um, he gets a phone call on the Monday to say, can you come and do the governor's for breakfast? And he says, that's in the middle of the three weeks. Yes. Perfect. So uh, we, all the arrangements are made, so Peter comes. And then uh, somebody suggested to me, why don't you facilitate some meetings? I thought, facilitate? I've never done that. Before. What is that? <laughs> well, just on the side, when I first got born again, a friend in the Church of Christ, very early in the piece, yes. said to me, you're a facilitator. Wow. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't take my face. Yeah, yeah. But I remember it now. So um, 
I, we did 25 meetings in three weeks around Perth. You know, I, I, there's sometimes... So you organise all of those with yeah, various churches and meetings and yeah, groups? Yeah, uh, colleges, wherever, you know. Um, and, um, you know, five people, 50 people, 500, didn't matter who we were. Yeah. Peter wasn't fussed with it, it was five or 50,000 people probably. And so, the big um, was the Governor's Tree Breakfast, that was that a was big, big Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I think the... Um, yeah, so was this the, the first man, sort of real evangelist? Was this the man that you were attached to? Because you were talking about that. Yes, yeah, so but obviously you think, is this one or that one? Yeah, yeah. And then as time's gone by, it took me about 10 years to give Peter that tape. It's oh, so, so, well. Yes, yeah, yeah, he's cautious. He's 10 and, years cautious. Yeah. <laughs> cautious. But you've got to remember, 1994, 2003, before yeah. it actually happened. You know, let's not be in a hurry. It's a long way. You say to people, wait, oh God, yeah, what, five minutes? No, give it 10 or 20 years. You know? But uh, it's, it's anyway, off we go. And we did all those things, and then we said we'll do some more next year. And then I tried a couple of people to sort of help. Yes. But that didn't work. Yeah. So one of the guys came and said, look, I can't do that. It's very annoying, that sort of thing. Now I just paid the contributors towards the ministry. So that happened for a few years. Then, um, and we've just been going ever since. Uh, from um, uh, ever since in nearly 20 years. What's the impact on the city? This city? Australia? No, what's the impact on the city, uh, the government of You know, I often wonder. Uh, there's times when some people come back and, and tell you something and it's yes. somebody's lost, but we're really touched by the breakfast. Yeah. Or somebody rings up and says they want to speak to the guest speaker or something. You hear, you hear something. Yeah. It's a bit like the 10 letters, right? You hear one comes back and says something, yeah. but you think maybe another nine. But nine it does it does bring a, a whole lot of churches and denominations yes. together, doesn't it? It, it? I think it. Um, so it is one of the highlight events of the city. That's what people tell me. Yeah, yeah. and it's also glamorous because it is usually at a five star conference center. Yes, yes. It's, um, well, that was one of the first things when I first got involved was that we needed to change the venue. And yeah, too many people, and then. I always remember I said to them, but you also need to have all the screens and microphones and I think that goes straight away with many thousands of dollars. Yes, of course. But so I, the I charge, was a big charge. You had the charge, you had yes, the charge. Yeah. Was it well, free initially? Or no, no, it was never free. charge. There's yeah. always you know, a, a, a charge to come. And um, over the years, I've um, had many interesting speakers and I've been involved in probably, I suppose, about uh, 16 or 17 of them over the years. Very interesting, lots of stories there. Yeah. God stories for sure. Maybe I can share one. There was yeah. a, 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 um, I was driving home with my mechanic one day, and so I had a guy that can do the governor's free breakfast. <laughs> and anyway, he, um, I said, oh, hey, who's that? You know, skeptical. He said, oh, a guy called Bob Edmiston. I said, oh, okay. And he said, he, he said he's, a, he's got a ministry called Christian Vision. I said, it's big. I said, okay. So anyway, um, I, I thought, well, I'll look into it. And um, so I was uh, just praying about it one day, and I thought, Lord, and I went out to a particular spot where I, went, I was troubled. I used to go sit on this little limestone wall and say, Lord, I just want to know, can you give me a testament about this one? Yeah. And I happened to ring the manager of 98.5 radio station. He, yes. I said, do you know this guy, Bobby? He said, yeah, I know his brother. Yeah. He said, and, yeah, there, 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 there's something there. And then at that same day, I was off to go to a luncheon with um, to listen to a guy called um, Jonathan Aitken. Now, okay. Jonathan Aitken wrote the book that went with the movie Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Yeah, and he was also had been a member of Parliament, mm -hmm. but he'd been put in jail for perjury. Okay. And um, anyway, he sort of got saved, and he ended up working as a, with Chuck Paulson in the prison ministry as a, with Alpha. Okay. So anyway, I was driving there, and I sort of like speak to Jonathan. Yeah. And I got there and all these politicians are sitting there at the table. Yeah, it's too, I can't speak to him. So I went to the loo. And I was about to leave and the spirit said, you can't talk to him. So I went in and I tapped him on the show and said, Jonathan, do you know Bob Emerson? He said, Bob Emerson, he put me through Bible college. Yeah. And so forth. And, went on. and I said, okay. And that was enough for me to pursue this guy. So I left a message with his PA. And uh, one morning at five o'clock, the phone rings and it's Bob. Oh, you've been trying to get hold of me? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I wanted to talk to you about doing the Governor's Prayer Breakfast this year, or next year, actually. And I, he said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll talk about it. 
So he started to get the arrangements in place. And uh, my Where was friend, he? Eh? Was he in West Australia? Or no, he lived in London. London. Mm -hmm. He was a, a very successful businessman. Okay. You know, but been bankrupt many times. Okay. Anyway, he um, was um, his friend, the mutual friend that we had, said to me, "Did Bob ring you?" I said, "He did." He said, "That has to be God because he never rings anybody." Wow. I said, "Okay, that's an, that's enough. Let's go for it." So I went for it, and then finally we had a committee meeting, and I wasn't the chairman at the time, and. Um, I said, this is the guy that I've arranged to come for the breakfast. And the chairman said, no, he's not. I said, really? He said, no, Ed Silva says no. So he had to ring. No, I decided to wait three weeks. So I waited. You're good at that, aren't you? He's wait, yeah. He's amazing. If you just wait, don't rush. <laughs> I waited, and the phone goes one afternoon. And it's Bob. He says, Trev, he says, I, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but I really can't make it. Yeah. I said, I've been, I'm being considered for the House of Lords, ah. so I can't make it, you know. I said, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks for ringing me. How about next year? He says, I'll do it next year. Okay. I never told him anything. Yeah. And um, so that's what happened. And he came the next year and he was, uh, he, was, he was an incredible speaker. And he said to me, can I tell them that God spoke to me and said, I'm going to minister kings and princes? So what are you, Absolutely. Don't you go to, yeah. you know, whatever, you know. Yeah. There's nothing to hold back here. It's your story. Yeah. So he came, and I think he impacted quite a bit. So that was just one. There's others. Beautiful, I'm sure there is. <laughs> All right, we need to wrap up. But just uh, before we so go, I'll tell you one more thing. Yeah. Very small. It's a very small testimony. Just how in, how God just is so personal and so he looks after the small things. Yeah. Small things. I was walking through Brisbane Airport with Peter one day, and this prayer came. I wasn't not it bypassed my mind. It just came out as I need a toothbrush. That's what, all I prayed. And I went, you oh, needed a toothbrush. a toothbrush. I needed a toothbrush. So I prayed, uh, I got on the plane, we, we travelled down to a place called Albury from Brisbane. Yes. Then we had some car travel to do to another place called Shepparton. And I was building with this lady who was, a, who was handicapped. And you walk into the room, and sometimes there's a towel and a piece of soap. But I walk into the room and there's a toothbrush. Wow. So I said to the lady, why did you put a toothbrush there? She said, God told me to. Praise God. The little story. I'll never forget that. So Trevor, what's the legacy do you want to leave behind? What do you want to, you want people to remember you by? I really want people to know is that just focus on Jesus and the things of the earth will grow strangely to just so focus on Jesus Bible. and the things of the world will, will grow strangely deep. Strangely deep. Yeah, yeah. They will disappear. You know, when you get involved and you don't have your prayer time and you don't have your quiet time, the world starts to come in on you. That's focus a good on Jesus. Yeah. Well, we value your contribution to the city, mm -hmm. the way you're advancing the kingdom of God and the way you are waiting on the Lord. I think this is a vital <laughs> lesson, so praise God for that. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on this Kingdom Stories from Down Under. My name is Nathaniel Costilla. I would value immensely if you could rate this, obviously five stars if possible, uh, in the, uh, through the channels that you're watching this or you're listening to this. Also share it with others and distribute it so it gets in more and more places. And come back and subscribe to this so you can hear us as we bring you more and more wonderful stories from Down Under. Uh, may the Lord bless you, strengthen you and carry on your assignment in the Kingdom of God. Thank you for joining us on Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate, and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, every story is worth sharing, including yours.